may be seated. Well, as we continue our path down the final weeks of Jesus' life, we are in obviously entering into the last week of his life. And what we're going to find is he continues to do as he has been doing. He continues to teach. He continues to preach. Where did my Bible go? There it is. He continues to make final statements about what he is about and about what he wants to offer to every person 2,000 years ago and still today. And he's going to talk a lot today. We're going to, we're going to talk about freedom. We're going to see things in the, the uh, processional into Jerusalem that have to do with freedom. And we're going to visit what he's teaching us about what truly sets us free, okay? So today I'm going to read two passages, one from the gospel, or both of them from the gospel of Matthew. The first one will be the traditional Palm Sunday uh, text from Matthew. The next one will be a short little text after he cleared the temple, which we talked about, I think that was last week. And we will be talking about a challenge that was given to him by what authority does he make the claims that he makes? And we'll take a look at that. Hopefully it all comes together by the time we're done, I hope, okay? Let's take a look at the uh, traditional Palm Sunday uh, section first, uh, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. They approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus then sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and, once, and at once you will find a donkey tied there uh, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right back. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, and they placed their cloaks on them. And Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut palm branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed about shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in the Galilee. And now we go a little bit further. He's already turned over the tables. He's left the city. He's come back into the city. And he's being challenged by the religious institution. Who do you think you are? Entering the city this way, allowing the children to cry out, letting people wave their palms and bring to mind all kinds of messianic uh, forms of communication, and then you have the nerve to come in and turn the tables of the temple upside down and call us a, 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 you know, a den of robbers. Who do you think you are? And Jesus, by his response, is saying, I am the one that has come to set you truly free. Listen to what he says, because as he goes with this, he doesn't answer their question right away. Instead, he says to them, I'll answer your question in a moment. And he says to them, what do you think? Was the baptism of John the Baptist, everybody remember who John the Baptist was? Was the baptism of John the Baptist, was that from God or was that from men? Well, the institution, the bureaucrats that are the religious people, they said, well, we don't want to answer this one. If we say it's from men, the people are going to get mad at us because everybody believes John was sent by God. But if we say he was from God, then they're going to say to us, why didn't you listen to him? And the one who was coming that he spoke of that person's authority. Why didn't you listen to him? So this is how Jesus answers that trap that they gave to him. So verses 28 through 32, real quick, then Jesus tells a parable that emphasizes what he just said. And Jesus responds, what do you folks think? There was a man who had two sons, and he sent the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. And the vineyard always has to do with the kingdom. Go and work in the vineyard. I will not, the son answered him, but later he changed his mind and he went and did the work. Then the father went to the other son and he said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two, Jesus then said to these religious leaders, which of the two did what his father wanted? And they, of course, answered the first. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, tax collectors and prostitutes 
are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, religious people. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness. And how did he show righteousness? Through Jesus, because he pointed to him, talked about him all the time. For John came to you to show the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw these wonderful things, you did not repent and believe him. Whew, what a challenge. Let's pray. Let's pray and then let's talk and then let's take communion. Lord, what you're talking about there with all these signs, all these symbols, the precious few days remaining in your life before you go to the cross, you're emphasizing and, and notifying and reminding people of what truly sets them free. For all those symbols that day had to do with independence and freedom. But you're trying to let them know you are the true way to independence, the true way to forgiveness, the true way to real freedom in life. Oh God, as we look at this text, as we wrestle with many of the same things that those folks did, help us not open our hearts to you and Holy Spirit, whatever you want to say to us individually, we give you permission to say to us, help us all with this. We ask and we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. And may all God's people say, amen. Well, how many people are pretty big on freedom? How many think freedom's a good idea? Okay. Almost, where are the, where are the rest of you from that you don't like freedom? <laughs> I think we'd all say freedom's a good thing. But with freedom comes responsibility, doesn't it? Decisions are made that have consequences based on what we do with that freedom. And Jesus is trying to make that very clear to people right now. I can give you a for instance about freedom. Now, as I may have mentioned a few times the last like four years or so, Mrs. Bowman and I were on a paleo nightmare diet. Did I ever mention that? We ate more kale than could, I could imagine was on the whole planet. Well, recently, the curtain on that has been lifted a little bit. I went the better part of four years hardly ever eating cheese because that was part of what we weren't supposed to do. So if I did it, I had to sneak it. Forgive me. Well, once the curtain was lifted, I had freedom. So last Monday, I'm watching Bryn and Sawyer, our grandchildren. Uh, they had spring break. Uh, Dad had to work. Mom had a chance to go somewhere, and she was going to be there Monday at noon. So I... Came anyway, I'm there at 7 o'clock uh, Monday morning to watch the kids. In the process of watching the kids, of course, Papa's got to make what? About noon. Lunch. Okay? Even though we had snacks like all morning, we got to make lunch. And, and Bryn and Sawyer, they wanted peanut butter and jelly, which I used to be a fan of, but eh, not, not so much. So I said, I'm not going to have peanut butter and jelly. And with my new freedom, I go into Alyssa's refrigerator. And guess what I discovered? Turkey and ham, and I didn't even check the sodium content. And pepper jack cheese. How many people love pepper jack cheese? Ah, I love pepper jack cheese. So I built this beautiful sandwich. It was beautiful. And Mila, their dog that I showed you a couple weeks ago, she's staring at me now. She got nothing that day from me. <clears throat> so I wolfed down this sandwich. And about 45 minutes later, I start feeling some things in my belly. Because I hadn't eaten much cheese. And I definitely hadn't eaten much pepper jack cheese. And I'd been drinking coffee all morning trying to wake up. And all of a sudden, I had this reminder, oh, yeah, spicy things in my tummy don't always go well together. So I'm sitting on the couch with that bloated feeling. And my, my granddaughter comes up to me and says, Papa, you know, are you okay? And I said, well, Papa ate some, ate some uh, cheese that's not really, it was, it, it was kind of spicy. And she said, you ate the spicy cheese? Like, I said, yes, Papa ate the spicy cheese. Well, freedom is a wonderful thing, but with freedom there can come what? Consequences. So sitting for the next four hours with a bloated belly and a tummy ache is part of the consequences. And while pepper jack cheese probably isn't going to change the world one way or another, what we also know about life is with freedom, there are bigger consequences, aren't there? 
We have choices all the time. What do we put into our bodies? How do we act? How do we respond to people? How do we respond to God? How much do we trust God? What do we believe about God? We're given freedom to make choices, but freedom has consequences, it has outcomes. As Jesus is marching into the city that day, we begin to see things that are all about illustrations of freedom. For instance, what, what, were, they, what were they waving when he walks into the city? They're, they're waving palm branches. Any idea why they're waving palm branches? This was incredibly significant to Jewish people. Any idea? What's that? Probably, yeah. <laughs> The, the palm branches were a sign of peace, but they were really a sign of independence. They're associated with the Psalms of talking about a time of independence when Messiah would come. And they, in the 100s BC, so like from 110 to the 60s, they became the symbol of a group of people called the Maccabees. And the Maccabees, through the military complex, they overthrew the oppressors of Israel for a short season. And there was a time of freedom until the Maccabees got conquered by the Romans. And, and so the, the palm branch is a sign of set us free. It's a sign of a cry of independence. The garments that were laid down before the Messiah, they, re they recognize that the people are seeing that this, this guy is really important and he's come hopefully to set us free. Imagine, they didn't have summer jackets, they didn't have winter jackets, they didn't have spring jackets. You know how many jackets they had? Probably one. And to take your jacket and to lay it on a dusty road and let a donkey ride over it, that's saying something, isn't it? So by doing that, it's a devotion. It's an honoring of the one they believe came to set them free. Then they're, then they're yelling something at the same time. What are they yelling? It's, a, it's a, a Hebrew word here. What is it? Hosanna. Have you ever wondered why that shows up in so many hymns and songs around this time of the year? Hosanna literally means... and. It's a number of different forms of this, but this is a really good kind of summary of what it means. Save us now. Set us free. Save us now. And they're saying that about Jesus. As the parade goes on, they're yelling, Son of David, Messiah. Why? What's David got to do with this? Well, David was king at the greatness of Israel. And, the, and the, the Psalms prophesied and other things prophesied that the Messiah would come in the reign of like David where there would be great freedom and independence that would come and set them free. As a matter of fact, they throw in the 118th Psalm or a part of it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's come to set us free. Now, if that wasn't enough, did you ever wonder why there's so many people in Jerusalem at this time? When Jesus, and Jesus chooses this time. God has chosen this time for Jesus to come in Jerusalem. What's going on in Jerusalem? What's about to go on? And it almost always coincides with our, our Easter. Passover. Well, well, real quick, what's Passover? Passover is a time when the children of Israel are in what land? Egypt. And are they there by choice? Are they free? No, they're enslaved. They're slaves. And they're being overworked. And it's cruel. And they're being crushed. And so God says to a man, anybody remember his name? Starts with them and rhymes with Moses. Moses, he says, go and tell Pharaoh. Yeah, you're going to go. Moses argues with him like six times. I don't want to go. You're going. And he says, you go to Pharaoh and you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And nine times God sends plagues upon the Egyptians. Pharaoh says, let them go. Get them out of here. I can't stand it. And every single time he changes his mind until we get to the 10th plague, which is the angel of death. And see, this is what Passover is about. The night that the angel of death comes, before that night, the Israelites are told, go out and you take the blood of what? A lamb, put it on your doorpost. And when the angel of death comes, he will see the blood of the lamb. And where, where he sees the blood of the lamb, what will death do? It will pass over. What a great symbol. Where death sees the blood of the lamb, it must pass over. It cannot touch it. Where the blood of the lamb is applied. Isn't that a great symbol for the future, which is our present? So Passover and the, oh, and the promised land, they end up getting set free. And, and all those people that leave, do you know how many ever get to the, get to the promised land? Two. Hey, I just showed you. Yeah. Anybody know their names? Candy, if you know their names. One starts with a J, one starts with a C. Joshua and 
Caleb, they're the only two that leave and get there because of disobedience and idolatry. And even though the children of Israel get set free in Egypt, it's a temporary thing because they go right back to the things that enslave them. And only two of them make it to the promised land. And even after that, their ancestors also find out that the freedom of Passover was only temporary. So Passover, the promised land, the Maccabees, David, the Psalms, they all pointed to something that was coming. But in the meantime, that which set them free was only a temporary and insufficient thing to set them totally free. Something else was needed. And as Jesus is answering the question about authority, what on earth allows you to do this and say this and present yourself that way as the one that's going to set people free? He tells a parable about the vineyard. And the vineyard always matches up in parables with the kingdom of God. So when he talks about going in the vineyard, it's about embracing the kingdom of God and embracing the things that make for freedom. And so he talks about there's one son who says, sure, Dad, I'll go into, I'll go, I'll go into the kingdom. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. But what's that son decide to do? Ah, he blows it off. Good lip service on Sunday morning, but when Wednesday comes around, yeah, I don't want it. Then the other son, maybe he didn't go to church that day. He says, no, Dad, I'm not going. When Tuesday comes around, what's he do? He goes into the kingdom that sets him free. And then Jesus asked the question. The vineyard, there was someone that was preparing the way for the vineyard. His name was John the Baptist or the baptizer. And John talked about three things all the time. First thing he talked about starts with R and rhymes with repent. Repent. What does repent mean? Stop going in this direction. Be sorry that you're going in that direction because you know it's the wrong direction. And you agree, I got to go the other way. That's what repentance is. John said repent for the what? The kingdom of God that is designed to set us free is now at hand. And then he says, and I have come to prepare for the most significant one that is the kingdom of God. And he prepared everybody for who? For Jesus. And so when they asked Jesus about authority, he asked them about why didn't you listen to John? And they're stupefied. Well, the wonderful thing about freedom is that Jesus wants us to know that he wants to give us three things today that truly make us free. And the three things are this. Number one, through his death and resurrection, as he has come to set us free, he wants to know that his death and his resurrection reach into our lives, and what do they defeat? They defeat the power of sin and death. His covering covers us from our errors, from our mistakes, from our sins. So Jesus has talked about, here's what sets you free. Number one, you receive me, and I will come in, and I will take away the power of sin and death in your life. Number one. Number two, you take me into your life as one who sets you free. I will give you the promise of eternal life. Now, this doesn't mean that you'll stop fearing death. We all fear death. But what it means is we will know and have confidence in that we have a place of reunion. And that when we sit in here with a coffin and we say goodbye to someone for the last time, we know it's not the last time. We know we can see them again. Whether it's down at the funeral home, we know we can see them again. When we sit in a room and someone has is, is got a terminal diagnosis, we know it's not over. We know we can see them again. When the horrible thing, the C word, comes into someone's life and it looks really, really bad. Jesus says, the freedom I give reminds you that death is not the winner, and I will promise you eternal life and the reunion that goes with it in the place where death and pain and sickness and tears are no more. Now, don't those first two things sound pretty good? And, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm paying for it on the cross. Your name is on the certificate that says it's yours if you claim it. That sounds really good, doesn't it? But you know what? There's a third thing he throws in. This is unbelievable. This is better than buy one, get one free. This is like three things that come into our lives. Not only has he given us the freedom to defeat the power of sin and death in life and the freedom to promise us and, and, and assure us of eternal life, but he also gives us the freedom of direction in life that takes away the uncertainty of how we should live. Let me say that again. 
You are God's handiwork. You are God's artwork. You are designed by God. You are designed by God to live in this world. You are designed by God to live with God's presence and with each other. This is a design that God has put together. And what God is saying is that as you've been designed, you've also been designed to be led into the direction in which you must live. And the closeness of depending upon Jesus and looking to Jesus for those answers, for those directions that God has made clear, are at our fingertips. And so even though the world's crazy and fearful, very challenging. God says, I will give you the freedom to be set free from the uncertainty of not knowing how to live. I will help you know how to live. And even when you drop the ball, I'll be there to help you through it and help to get you back on track. So if you would be free, the freedom can start Right now, you may find yourself on point number three. You know, point number one, if, if you don't know you can be saved from sin and death, you can be. Jesus promised it. Point number two, if you didn't know that you could receive the kingdom of heaven, Jesus promised that, that as we accept him into our lives, he forgives us. But point number three, a lot of Christians have accepted him and they believe he can defeat them from the power of sin and death, but they don't know he also wants to guide them in everyday life. Because he loves them. He doesn't want them to face uncertainty on their own. So today, you may be sitting here struggling with an issue, struggling with a promise, struggling with uncertainty of how to go forward in this confusion that is called life. And Jesus says, I love you, I designed you, and I want to help you right now. I want to give you complete freedom to know even how to live on a daily basis. And the promise can be accepted right now. Did you know that? Right now. Anybody ever heard of Oswald Chambers? Oswald Chambers great, wrote devotions, a really bright guy, way brighter than me. And, and the one devotion that's probably his most famous is my utmost for his highest. And it was kind of a WWJD, what would Jesus do before the WWJD was really famous, okay? And Chambers presents my utmost for his highest. And, and Chambers says this about this gift of freedom that Jesus wants to give to us. He says, God never guides us at some time in the future. Like it's simply something off in the future. Oh, someday you can get the kingdom of heaven. You're kind of on your own as you live right now. God has kind of wound up the mechanism, put people here, and now he watches to see what will happen. That's what deists believe in, and to me it's nonsense. It's not in the book. So Chambers says, God never guides us at some time in the future, but always what? Here and now. Realize that the Lord is here now. He is alive. He is here now, and the freedom that you can receive from sin and death, the freedom that you can receive from knowing that there is eternal life in heaven, and the freedom that you can receive and be set free from decisions you make in life and how you live your life, it is here and now. It is available to every person because God doesn't want us stumbling through life, banging our heads with complete uncertainty. He loves us too much. That would be like me taking, I don't know if you knew it, but we had four kids. Well, we got, we got four kids, and one time, one time they were all very little, running around every direction, you know. We had triplets. And it would be like if we said to our son Jacob, if we didn't give him guidance, it would be like, okay, I'm going to watch Jacob. He's approaching the stove that's on. It's very hot. Jacob is going to go up and touch the stove. Gee, should I stop him? If I let him go, he's going to learn a really big lesson, right? Of course, it will de deform his hand. I should stop him, and I should take him and show him, don't touch that. That will hurt you. Even though you've got the freedom, Jacob, you shouldn't touch it. It will hurt you, and Dad's telling you this because he loves you. Do you see the similarities there? So Chambers is saying that freedom 
to know the direction in which we should live is available for us right now. There doesn't have to be uncertainty. And anything you're fearful of that you're wrestling with, God will give you guidance. Anything the church, the nation has to face, God will give us guidance if we'll just receive it. Now, <clears throat> anybody know what this is? And for some of our younger people, they may not know. Can everybody see what this is? Can anybody see what this is? Well, what a lousy illustration. Can you see now what this is? Uh, it's, a, it's a lock, and what kind of lock is it? It's a, well, yes, yes, it's literally a master lock, but what kind of lock is it? A combination lock. All right. Now, a combination lock means that this thing is going to stay locked until I do what? Put the right combination, and usually it's three numbers, and it's written here on the box. I usually find something like this without a combination on it when I need it in about 15 minutes. This thing's got the combination, and what that combination tells me is how to unlock this lock and set it free. But there's only one combination, right? And there's an order in which it has to go. This is how Jesus wants to work in our lives to set us free. And I'm going to give you a quick acronym in closing now that talks about what is the right combination for the life that sets us truly free. Hold on to your hats. We're going to talk fast because I know i got communion and I'm running out of time. So hold on quick, okay? This acronym that we're going to get is the acronym REST FIRM, okay? REST FIRM. Everybody got that? And why am I saying REST FIRM? Because I want us to rest firm in who? In Jesus. With confidence, I want us to rest firm in Him. Now, here's the combination that sets us free. With rest, the first part is the letter R. And R, in this case, is standing for what? Repent. First step in finding the freedom that Jesus wants to give to me in my life is I have to repent. I have to admit that the way I was living my life is wrong. It's getting me into toxic yuck. It's not working. I don't have peace. I don't have hope. I might feel good for a little while with that pepper jack cheese going down, but by the time the afternoon comes, it's not working. So repent is, I realize that what I'm doing and the way I'm going is wrong. I'm sorry about it. And I stop and I say to God, God, start to help me to go the right direction. I'm sorry for what I've been. Then the E in rest is engage in his what? Engage in his grace. Do you know why Jesus died on the cross? Because he wants to give you grace. He wants to reach into your life, and he wants you to receive something from him. He wants you to receive forgiveness. In fact, the Bible talks about you become, you and I, we become new, create, create, new creatures when we receive this grace. That means everything the pastor, done, Dan, the pastor Dan has done in the past, that doesn't paint who I am. It has been forgiven. I still may have to live a little with the consequences of the spicy cheese, but I'm forgiven. I'm a new creation. He wants us to engage his grace. He wants us to allow ourselves to be forgiven. Christians in the West are not very good at this. Did you know that? We say, yeah, I believe you're forgiven. I believe the Bible says I can be forgiven, but does God really know about what I did back then? Yeah. And he says, you're forgiven. So repent to be free, engage in his grace, and then I love this next one. Stay in his what? Why? Because he wants to lead your life. He wants to keep you from the, the hot burner. He wants to help you out of love. Repent to be free. Engage in his grace. Stay in his presence. And then the T part in rest. Trust his what? Integrity. What, what does integrity mean? What's integrity? promise, his, his character, his, the, the who he is, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, and the all-loving one who knew you before you were born, who wants to lead your life and set you free. Trust his integrity that what he says is true. Make sense? So we repent, we engage in his grace, we stay in his presence, we trust in his integrity. There's the rest part. Now look at the next part here real quick. Hang with me. Now I believe that he's got something to say to my life. 
And he doesn't just say, just go out, Dan, and live how you ever want to live and learn your mistake, learn from your mistakes. Yeah, I learned a lot from my mistakes, believe me. But what he's saying is, I want to guide you so you're not going to make so many mistakes. I want to guide you so you're not going to be going down the wrong path. I want to guide you so you're not enslaved to something that gets a hold of you. I want to guide you so you learn how to live with others the way that you should live with them and they with each other. So we focus on his word. And if we trust in his integrity, what do we believe about his word? That it starts with T and rhymes with rue. That's true. And for us. So we focus on his word so we can learn about where he wants to lead us. And then the I in the, the, the uh, acronym FIRM is then since we trust his integrity and we focused on his word, now it's time to initiate his instructions. I'll never be perfect, but I'm going to keep seeking to live the way that he wants me to live. I'm going to keep pursuing his standard, his guidelines, his house rules. Remember we talked about that last week? Focus on his word so I can initiate his instructions. And I love this because I need this all the time. The R in firm is so that I can respond to his mentorship. What does a mentor do? Guides, coaches, teaches, corrects. And that he or she always does that out of love and care, right? So I want to stay close to him because as I'm focusing on his word and as I'm initiating his instructions, I want to respond to his moment-by-moment GPS coaching. Here's how I pray most days, and I have bad days when I don't pray this way, better days when I do. One of the last things I'll say in my morning prayer is the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, I know who I am. I am begging you. I'm not just giving you permission. I am begging you to tug on my heart when I'm saying the wrong thing, when I'm listening to the wrong stuff, when I'm looking at the wrong stuff, when I find myself having an attitude about stuff I shouldn't have an attitude about. Because I know I can drift. Even though I love you, even though I believe in your word, even though I want to be set free, what do I know about myself? I can drift. Anybody else in here capable of drifting from time to time? And so I say, Holy Spirit, please correct me. And I always run gently, but get my attention. I want to respond to your mentorship because I will not be finished on this planet while I breathe. Keep growing me. And then finally, the last part, uh, the M for firm. Model his mannerisms. Because you know what? You can say and do the right thing, but you can do it the wrong way, can't you? Jesus' mannerisms were the kingdom of God has come for every person. No one is disposable. And even if they are enslaved to something they should not be enslaved to, it is the reminder, I have come to set you free too. And so no Christian can ever look at any other person and say, you're not welcome here or you don't matter. But as we try to live together under God's standard, we have to do it like Jesus did, right? So the M is uh, model his mannerisms. This, my friends, in closing, is what I believe the Bible says to be the combination be set free. But who makes the choice for every individual? Put your thumb on your chest. I make the choice myself. How I'm going to live. Who I'm going to trust. What I'm going to seek. Will I be set free? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. You love us so much. I know there's times I try your patience. I know there's so many times I don't get it right. That might be true for at least a few people in here, huh? Help us to know how much you love us. Help us to know how you want to set us free. And help us truly wrestle with this stand firm business that we might be set free indeed. We ask this and we seek this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all God's people say, Amen.